Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yep. Good. OK, so uh, just a little intro. Why, why am I doing this before I say what I'm doing? Um, so previously I did a talk about what I consider to be the important thing about data modeling, accurate data modeling, and also the importance of parsing into those accurately defined data models at the boundaries of our systems. And I went into quite a bit of detail about why I think that's important. So I wanted to kind of follow up a little bit and delve into how we can do that, how we can create precise data models and how, and also a little bit of how we can do parsing. So when I say accurate data models, I mean, to recap, models with correct cardinality, meaning the correct number of possible inhabitants of the types. And if you think about like the, the most basic example of that, you can think of a Boolean. It, it has to be precisely true or false. There's no kind of whatever value. So, however, in, in throughout the systems that we're dealing with, it's quite common to see vagueness in this area. The data modeling is kind of quite commonly a bit vague um, and imprecise, and this leads to um, accidental complexity and sort of just general brittleness in code. So, because I think that data modeling thing and the parsing thing is so central to writing good software, I thought I would try and explain a little bit about um, algebraic data types, which are um, something you might not be familiar with, and how they can be used to express types very precisely and elegantly uh, and capture our intent uh, very succinctly in a way that you might not have experienced uh, in some languages. Um, and also, while we're along the way, we'll try and explain a little bit about how parsing can be done in Haskell, show off a little bit of Haskell along the way. Um, so, what actually is parsing? Just define it first so we know what we're talking about. It's basically just taking any unstructured data and turning it into some structured data. Um, and in, in specifically in our case, we are often talking about a stream of bytes, usually string, which is some string representation of structured data. And we usually parse it in sort of two steps. We, we, Firstly, we use JSON parsing quite commonly to just basically assert that the stream conforms to the syntax of JSON AST. And then subsequently, there's often a second step to pass from this JSON AST into some domain type, like a student or whatever, right? It's also sadly quite common to see the second step not performed. So we're just passing around JSON values in, in our systems quite a lot. And this leads to a lot of um, what is sometimes called the shotgun parsing or, or the sort of ad hoc validation or guard clauses deep within our system to, conf to confirm that what we've established is valid JSON is also valid for our domain. And this complicates the whole code base. We really want that sort of thing done at the boundaries. So there's that two phase process. I'm only going to deal with the first phase today, the getting from the stream to the JSON. I do have more code to do the second phase, but I'm not going to have time to deal with that today. So what am I going to do? If you see the screen here, hopefully it will be done in about an hour. I'm going to write a JSON parser. There will be no if statements. There will be no while statements, no control flow of any kind, no explicit error handling, no explicit iteration, no regex. And it will be less than 100 lines of code, probably. Um, and it should be a fully functioning JSON parser without any of those things. So I hope. So if we consider what what I just described parsing to be is a, a conversion from, a, in this case, it's going to be a string to some structured type. The first thing we need to do is figure out what is our input string going to be and what is our output type going to be. So. Uh, just a word about what's on my screen. You can see my text editor on the left here. On the right, we've got the Haskell compiler running interactively to tell me if I make any mistakes. And then below that, I've just done another terminal where I'm going to run the REPL in the end, but nothing there at the moment. 
So I've got this test JSON file. Now it's somewhat simplified, but it, it shows us enough to make the point. It's got a lot of the important features of JSON. We've got objects with keys and values, the values of different types, strings, numbers, nested objects, arrays of numbers, arrays of nested objects. And, and there's enough complexity here for us to get our teeth into. Some things I am going to simplify. I'm not going to worry about escaping strings and so, so on. I'm not going to worry too much about the potential complexities of number parsing because you know there's there's lots of um, worms in that can with separators and scientific notation and all that sort of shenanigans. I'm just going to keep it simple. It wouldn't change the structure of our parser if I did deal with all that stuff, but it would just take longer. So, so that's that's what our input's going to look like. We're going to try and parse that. Um, so the first thing that we have to define is the output type. Um, so I've created this stub Haskell module here, and that's where we're going to define this data type. Um, so this data keyword here is me declaring a type. Data J value means I'm going to declaring a type called J value. And this is the type that I wish to represent the whole AST of JSON simplified as it will be. So before we try, at the moment I've got one value there undefined, but before we fill that in, I'm just going to do a little crash course on algebraic data types and what, what that means. It's a sort of scary sounding name, um, but it but it's not really. But it might be unfamiliar to you. If you, if you have a background in like, like say Java or C Sharp, it might be a bit unfamiliar. So imagine you have a data type and it has some properties, say X and Y. If you consider the possible state of that data type, you'll see that it amounts to all of the possible states of X multiplied by the possible states of Y. And because of this multiplication, that sort of type is known as a product type. And it models an AND relationship. There's an AND relationship between the properties of X and Y. That type has both X and Y. OK, that's a product type. And it's not always what we want. Sometimes we want to model an OR relationship. We want to say that the type has X or Y. Now, the possible states in this case would be the possible states of X plus the possible states of Y. And we would call that a sum type. So that's really the only crucial bit of information you need to know. There's product types and there's sum types. And we can see that you need both for accurate data modeling. And it also should be clear that the number of possible states for a sum type will be lower than the number of possible states for a product type. And that is it can also be thought of as lower complexity. So if you if you really want a sum type, you should use a sum type. And if you have a language which doesn't make that easy, you're in trouble. But fortunately, we're not using such a language, using a language that makes it easy. So that was a little aside on algebraic data types. That's all we need to know about them, really. So if we come back over here, we want to think about what does the JSON AST look like? Um, and it, we, we, it's sort of a composite thing, isn't it? We've got these low level fragments like strings and numbers and booleans and nulls. And then we've also got these higher level concepts like arrays and maps that will themselves recurse. And it, it kind of might not be easy to see how we can represent that as a single type, but we can do that. So if we take the low level bits first, we can represent, for example, a string like this. So what this means, if you think of everything on the left of the equal sign as the type, so the type is J value, everything on the right hand of the equal sign will be the constructors that we can use to create J values. So this word here, J string, is literally a constructor function and accepts itself accepts a string. So it's a function we can call. We can give it a string that actually captures the JSON string that we're trying to represent, and it returns a J value representing that string. So that's one of the fragments that we can represent. And then we just keep oring 
the possible constructors until we've got a complete picture of this JSON type. So we can also represent booleans, and we'd want to create a constructor that accepts a boolean for that. We can also represent numbers. I'm going to simplify numbers and say that they're always doubles, just for the sake of uh, sanity. We could also have null values, null values that are a little bit different in that they don't capture any data with them at all. There's just nothing. So we can just use this j null. This is still a function. It's still a constructor function. It's, it's like a parameter, parameterless constructor in a way, and it's like a, a nullary function that we can call. So that's pretty much the basic low level fragments, but then we need to be able to sort of recursively build these higher level things, objects and arrays. So an array would need to carry with it a list. So we can express that list type like this, but it's a list of some things. What? So the thing is here, we don't actually know what type of thing we're going to find in a in JSON array. We just know that whatever it is, it has to itself be uh, a valid JSON value. So we can just put in the type itself, and that's how we get the recursive nature of this um, type. Does that make any sense to anyone? Yeah, no, good. Yeah. And then the final, sorry. And just confirmed. Okay, good. And then the final one is the object. Now we think of what an object looks like. It's going to be a map. Um, it's going to be a map type of key value pairs where the key is a string and the value, well, the value again can be anything. It just has to be a valid J value instance itself. So we would create a Haskell map, key is string, value is J value. And then let me just uh, get rid of that. This piece at the bottom here, um, this show here is, you can think of that like an interface. Um, if you're familiar with uh, other languages, it's quite common to have a, a, an interface that tells the runtime how to serialize uh, an instance of a class. So th th this is actually a type class. This is the Haskell mechanism. It's a little bit like a type, um, an interface, but it's also slightly different. Think of it like an interface. It, we, we could implement this manually if we wanted to, but it's for our purposes, it's sufficient to just to ask Haskell compiler to derive the implementation of show for us. And this just allows us to print anything, any instances of this type out to the console. So that is the beginning and the end of our type. Um, it's really nice, really precise definition of all of the rules of our simplified JSON. It captures the recursion. It captures the fact that we can only use one of these constructors at a time by using this or syntax to create a sum type. And it would be impossible for us to create an invalid instance of this type. If you're, if you're um, absolutely familiar with the JSON spec, you'll know that's not quite true because the root uh, has to be an array or an object. But I'm just going to, I'm going to choose to implement that constraint within the parser rather than within the type. We could, we could do it in the type, but it would, it would muddy the waters a little bit. Yeah. So, quick question, sorry to interrupt. Uh, the, yeah. What was the, the the show thing, the deriving show? I, I yeah. So that's C, it's like, think of it like an interface. So in Java and, and C sharp, I think Java anyway, in, certainly in C sharp, you have like a two string interface and you can, uh, you can either manually implement it or you can just get it to derive it for you. So oh, it's just, it's just maybe more like an extension of an abstract class or something like that. Um, it, it's it, within the Haskell is a type class implementation, but it's most analogous to an interface within, uh, OO kind of languages. Uh, like I, I should probably say, I don't, I, I don't really intend this to be like a full-on Haskell tutorial because I think we'll get like lost in the woods if we do that. But um, I will try and tell you as much as 
you need to know and then we can take it from there if anyone wants to know more um but it's just uh yeah it's just a it's just i need to do this otherwise i won't be able to print out values of this type to the console yeah cool good i i heard you mention it but i missed that so that's all thanks okay so here we have the type that we're going to pass to and it's and we're happy with that now um so the next thing is to think about how to write the parser okay firstly a little bit of um boilerplate we have a main module in um any haskell project don't worry too much about syntax but it, it's not too hard to follow what's going on here we're reading the input file into this input uh, binding and then we're running a function called parse we're giving it a json parser and the input the result of that process will be a sum type which is either successful or isn't successful by convention that is called left and right left is the error case right is the success case so we can pattern match that this case statement so we either get left of error in which case we're going to show the error or we get right and we can pick out the correctly parsed json and we can print that to the terminal so that's just boilerplate we don't really need to worry about that. The thing we're interested in is this, this thing here. This is the thing we've got to write, the parser. So that's going to go in this module here, right? So we're going to be using a parsing library called Parsec. There's quite a few parsing libraries in Haskell, but Parsec's quite a popular one. Um, Parsec is capable of parsing from any stream. We, we want to specifically pin that down to parsing from a string, which is what this little bit of uh, utility function is. So just don't worry too much about that. It's just a bit of housekeeping. What we're really interested in is this. So another word about Haskell syntax. This line 11 is the function signature. Parse JSON is the function name. Then we get this double colon. And then to the right, we get the function um, type arguments so it will be uh, a list of arguments and then finally a return type we don't have any arguments in this case we just have a return type and the return type is parser of type j value which you can read as a parser which if successful will yield an instance of the j value type so pause for another aside what is a parser um so we're going to need to op understand a little bit about what these things are and, and about how we can operate on them, but not too much. It, it looks a bit like a function, but it's not quite a function. It's going to be a set of instructions. The parser itself will be a set of instructions on how to consume characters from our input string and convert them to some structured format and return that, that structured format or fail in the attempt. So you may be intuitive to think of a parser a bit like a black box and it's a box in this case that may or may not contain a j value uh, we don't know what the box does we don't care what the box does we just know that what, what it what it should have inside it okay that intuition will take you so far uh, it's not totally accurate but it, i think it's useful so Think of it as a box. We can take things out of the box. We can run functions against them and we can put them back in the box. Right. So when we build parser, we're going to build it out of lots of smaller parsers and we're going to combine those smaller parsers together into a larger whole. And in so doing, we're probably going to have to transform the contents of one parser or another parser and transform its type and put it back in another parser. OK. Um, that's a concept we're going to have to understand so to to convey how that works we're going to talk about mapping right you everyone will be familiar with mapping as uh, something that you do on a list for example so you've got a uh, a list of integers and you want to create a list of strings you map it and you map it over the function to string okay and that creates the intuition that mapping has something to do with iteration and something to do with function application but i just really need you to try to separate those two things in your mind 
the iteration and the function application because they are one is central to mapping and one is not the the iteration aspect of it is a function of the fact that it's mapping on a list lists have lots of things in them so you have to iterate the things the function application bit is the bit that's crucial to the map function okay so it's equally possible to map a parser so if we want, I had a parser that resolved to an integer and we wanted to create a parser that resolved to a string, we would map that parser and we would give it a function that takes an integer and returns a string. So just hang on to the intuition that mapping is about function application, it's not about iteration. So that's, that's kind of the important concepts we need to understand when manipulating these parsers. Right. Now we can actually start. OK, exhale. So like I said before, the the, you, the JSON spec tells us that uh, the root level has to be either an object or an array. So the, the way I kind of like to write Haskell is to just do it, just write tons of tiny little functions and not necessarily even implement the bodies of the functions until I've got everything straight in my head. So we can see here we've we've got on line 11 we've got the function signature on line 12 we've got the function implementation and it's currently set to undefined. Haskell will allow that. Haskell's lazy. It doesn't it's not going to hit a problem with that until it actually evaluates that function. So it's going to compile just fine. So you can create a whole story in your head in types without ever really implementing any of the bodies and it will it will compile and it will allow you to be very confident that you've you've got the the right structure and then a matter of just filling in the bodies and it all just falls into place. So to that end, we think about what the top level parser has to be. Well, it has to, it has to be parsing an object or an array. Okay, and that doesn't exist. So we're going to create it. And that's also going to be the parser of type J value. And then we can split that in two as well. And I want the smallest bits I can possibly reason about. That's generally the way I like to do it. So that's going to be parser an object. Or, and here's the first fancy bit of syntax. Parser array. So when I said at the beginning there wouldn't be any if statements, this is because Haskell has some slightly more refined um, abstractions for control flow, and this is one of them. So this is nothing to do with parsers exactly. This is a more abstract um, in uh, infix operator, and it and it just means alternative. It's it's based on the alternative type class, and it basically means if you have something on the left and something on the right, it's up to that type to define what that means. What does one of these or one of these mean? For parsers, it means what you'd expect it to mean. It means try and do that. If that doesn't work, try and do that. So that's a way for us to avoid the sort of if statements and things like that. We can say sort of a little bit more precisely what we mean. So then what does parse object look like? That again is going to be, well, in this case, what we're trying to do here is basically create parsers that are analogous to the branches of our sum type. So if we want to parse an object, we want to create a parser that gives us one of these maps. So that's going to be the type of this parser. It's going to be a parser that yields a map J values. And let's come back to that. And let's import map.
and then pars array. So if we look back at the sum type above, we'll see that that needs to be a parser that gives us a list of J values. Okay, so far so good. You can see that I've got some compilation errors here. Now, what's going on? So up here we've got this or this, right? And in when we've got this or this, both sides of the equation have to be of the same type. Now we haven't got that at the moment. We've got a parser that returns a map on one side, and we've got a parser that returns an array on the other side. So we need those two parsers to actually be the same type. And the type that we need them to be, both of them, is a parser of J value. So remember when I was talking about mapping. Mapping is a way for us to apply a function to the contents of the black box that is the parser. So if we wanted to convert the parser that is a map into a parser of j value, what we need is a function that takes a map and gives us back a j value. And what we need over here is a function that takes a list of j values and gives us back a j value. When we establish those two functions, we can simply map these parsers against these functions. Now, if you look up here and remember that I said that these are constructors, these literally are functions. So this J object is a function that takes a map and returns a J value. It's exactly what we need already. J array is a function that takes an array of J values and returns a J value. So that is also exactly what we need. So all we need to do to make this happy is map this parser against J object. And this is how we do that. And map this one against J array. and all our squiggles go away. So what's happening there? So we've got another infix operator. This basically means take the thing take the, the thing on the right here and map it against this function on the left and then return the result. So that's going to convert the parse object parser from a parser of map into a parser of j value. So now both sides of that alternative equation are returning the same types and the compiler is happy. So we're all good. Now, is everyone still vaguely with me? Yep. Cool, cool, cool. Good. good. So now at this point, I want to reflect on what objects and arrays actually are. If we have a look at this, we can see that an object is an opening character, curly brace, closing character, curly brace, and a list of things separated by commas. It's a list of key values separated by commas. And what is an array? An array is an opening character, square bracket, closing character, square bracket, and a list of things separated by commas. So in a sense, they're exactly the same, or they have something in common, and we can use that to our advantage. If we consider that we would like to create a generic parser that can deal with both of these things. So we might call that parse uh, a comma set list. And in the case of an array, we want to give it opening character of that, closing character of that. And then we need to tell, we need to give it another parser for how to parse the things that we expect to find between the commas. 
So let's say that in the case of an array, that can be any JSON value. It can be any branch of our sum type, strings, booleans, nulls, nested objects, nested arrays. So we're going to need a general value parser, any kind of value. So I'm just going to leave that um, unimplemented for now. But we're going to know we know what it needs to look like. It needs to look like opening character, ending character, and then it needs to be given some kind of parser. We use this lowercase a to denote that we don't actually know or care what type um, of parser we're going to be using for the for the things in between the commas. And then what we expect to be returned from this, what we expect this parser to yield, is whatever A is, we expect to get back a list of A's. Okay. And we'll come back and deal with that in a minute. So then if we think about what um, parse object would look like in terms of this. Well, these are going to be different. This is going to be one of them. This is going to be one of them. And then we're going to need a different parser for the things in between the commas, because in this case, it's not simple straight value. It's a key value pair. So we're going to need something that looks like that as well. OK, so let's stop that out. And that's going to be, well, what is the key value going to look like? It's going to look like a string and a J value. That's what we need to get out of that. And we'll leave that undefined for now. And then let's turn our attention to the, the value because we're going to. This is going to be the. Notice that we haven't actually done any parsing yet. This is simply just composing little functions together at the moment. Um, so parse values. That one. is going to be a parser of type J value. So let's go ahead and look, think about what this should be. So this, this is a little bit like the parse JSON function that we started with. This one says that we can have an object or an array, but for values within the JSON structure itself, we have a lovely look at this. We can we we can have any of these types. We can have array or object or null, or num, or bool, or string. OK, so we can actually reuse what we've already built for the first part of it, because it's fine for it to be an object or an array. And then we can just compose that with the other branches of the sum type that we need to capture using the, the alternate operator that we've already seen. So it's either an object or an array, or a string or it could be a boolean or it could be a number or it could be no so let's just let's just um Stop those out. Sorry, a little bit of typing to watch here. Not much.
So does that make sense that we're just object or array, which we already have, or string or bool or num or null, okay? Um, now, parse null is a little bit interesting because we don't have any value that we wish to capture here. We just want to run a parser against the literal string null and then throw away the result of that parser and then simply return the value j null. So the first part of that, we can use our very first piece of actual parsing. The, uh, one of the basic building blocks from the parsec uh, parsing library, which is string. And this basically attempts to parse a literal string. So that will, the, the type of that expression there, string null, will be a parser of type string. Like we've seen before, all of the branches of the alternate expression have to have the same type. We've got many different types here. We've got parser of string, parser of bool, parser of double, and another parser of string. So we, we need to harmonize these. All of these need to be parsers of J value. And so we need to do the same trick that we did up here. We need to map each of those parsers against the relative, the relevant constructor branch of our sum type. So this one would have to be mapped against J string. This one would have to be mapped against uh, J bool. This one would have to be mapped against J num. But what about the last one? So the last one, the map requires us, this map operator requires us to give a function that accepts parameter of the type of this thing. So if we were try if we tried to do this, we'd have a problem because J null doesn't accept a string. And string null yields a parser of type string. So what we actually need to do is ignore the string. We, we, this parser will yield the string null. We want to ignore that string, and we can do that with a slightly different operator, which is this one. And that just means ignore whatever comes out. Of, it's equivalent of doing a map and ignoring whatever comes in in the map function and just returning a constant value. And that's what we want to do in the case of null. So now we just need to um, start doing the actual low level parsing. We're, we're quite a long way through with the building blocks now. So what does a string look like? We can have a, another look at the JSON. It's going, let's say for the sake of simplicity that it must begin and end with double quotes and it can have anything in between. We're not gonna worry about um, escaped double quotes within the string and all sorts of other things that would complicate our lives. We're just going to keep it simple. So, what it looks like, we need to pull out some more building block parsers from the Parsec library. The first one we need is char. This is going to match a single character in the input stream and consume it. So we're going to match the single character double quote. Now, we need then to ignore that consumed value because we don't actually care about that quote. We're just using it as a delimiter to, to help us identify the fact that we've encountered a string. So we want to ignore that parser. And the way we sequence multiple parsers is to use this operator. Now, this looks a bit funky but what it means basically is one when we have something on the right it's going to mean run the thing on the left ignore the result and then proceed to the thing on the right but only if we actually matched this parser on the left and it kind of once you get used to it it kind of makes sense it's an arrow pointing in the direction you're interested in so we're not interested in the char uh, double quote we're interested in what comes next so what comes next will be a sequence of characters until we hit another double quote. 
So we need to pull some other low level parsers from Parsec library here. We want many till. So the many till is a parser that you give two other parsers. The first parser you give it is the thing you want it to repeatedly match. And then the second parser you give it will be the terminating parser. So many match the first one until you hit the second one. So we want to match any char, which is another built-in parser, until we hit the next double quote. I can remember how to type. Okay. So just recap, what that is saying is find double quote, throw it away, and then match me any character repeatedly until you hit the end quote and return the list of characters that you matched. And a list of characters in Haskell is the same type as string. String is just an alias for a list of characters. And this uh, many till and any char you said, it's not part of the library or anything, it's just... This is part of the parsec parsing library, yeah. Okay. And many till and any char. Makes sense. Okay, so that's our string bit done. Bool next. So a boolean, it, it's a little bit like this case up here with null, because we want to match, but in this case, we want to match one of two possible strings. We either want this literal string true or the literal string false. So we do the same sort of thing. We're going to go string true or string false. Now, what we're going to find is a type mismatch here because string true is a parser of type string, as is string false. So the overall expression of the uh, or of those two things is also going to be a parser of type string. We need a parser of type bool. So we need to map both of these things. And this might look a bit weird, but we can do that. And that. And the reason that might look a bit weird is because you might be used to thinking of true and false as um why isn't that happy? Ah, the reason it's not happy is because true and false don't require parameters. So of course we need to throw away the string. So the reason that might look weird is because you're used to thinking of true and false as <coughs> values rather than functions, and they are values, <clears throat> but they are also nullary functions. So if you imagine that the data type of Boolean is defined like this, then just as we saw with our sum type, this is the type, and these are the two possible constructors. So they are functions, they can be used as functions. And that's exactly what we're doing here to essentially map these two string parsers to the two different branches of the Boolean type. Does that make sense? Yep. Yes. Uh, OK, numbers. Numbers are a lot more complicated than I'm going to make out here, but life's too short, or this session is too short. We'll do it the easy way. We have. Um, we can just use two built-in parsers for this to get us most of the way there. Many digit. So what this is going to do is basically keep consuming characters as long as they are digit characters. And that will yield a string, but a string that only contains digits. So that gets us half the way there. We don't want a string, we want a double. So there's no guarantee that it actually is possible to convert an arbitrary string of digits to a double, but we're going to gloss over that just because uh, it's it's too much to bite off. But we can use this built-in Haskell function to just blindly try and convert the string of digits into a double. Haskell will use the type signature here as a hint of what, what read should do. Um, you probably got the impression 
that Haskell is an absolutely bulletproof safe language, but it really isn't. It's littered with things like this, which are completely unsafe and it will blow up at runtime very easily. So do not do this at home. But um, that's what we're going to do today. Uh, by the way, you wouldn't do any of this at home, obviously, because you don't need to write your own JSON parser in Haskell, but it's kind of fun to try. So we still have a squiggle up there on line 19. So we've got we've, we've done our all of our parse values now. We've got nearly everything we need. We have a problem up here, parsing object. The reason we have a problem here is because parse comma separated list takes the type of this nested parser that we give it and returns a parser of a list of that type. So parse comma separated list in the parse object case. To see what that returns, we need to look at parse key value. Parse key value returns a parser of string value tuple. So what we're going to get overall is a list of string value tuples. And what we said we're going to get is a map of string values. So we've got a type mismatch here. So again, we're going to need to map this against some function to convert it from a list of string value tuples into a map of string values. And we have a perfect function for that from the map module, which is just map from list. And that'll do the conversion for us. And our remaining squiggle goes away. So we are getting there. So next, I want to have a look at this um, parse comma separated list. What is this actually going to do? So we said that we're going to give this a start character, an end character, and a parser for the individual items. Right. Now, first thing we want to do is try and match the start character. He's so far so good. And again, we're not interested in that start character. We just want to match it so that we can detect that this is the right pattern. So we want to throw that away. Using that. And then next in the sequence, we want to iteratively apply the parser that we've been given repeatedly with some separator. Okay, and we, we have another built in function which is going to help us do that called set by. And set by accepts the parser that we expect the individual item to be matched by and a parser that we expect to match the separator on. So the separator in this case is going to be char and of comma. And then there's a little complication here that we need to be careful about ignoring trailing white spaces. So that is that thing between the parentheses there is the overall separator parser we want to match the comma and then ignore any spaces. And then finally, we want to look for our end character. Now there's one other gotcha here that's going to cause us a problem and that is white space. We don't, we could, we could just sort of compress our JSON, but there, there may well be spaces on either side of these um, uh, delimiting characters. So I think in this case, it's useful to write a little utility. So I'll just put down the bottom here called trim. And it's going to accept a parser of any kind and just return the parser of the same kind. And we're going to define that as match any spaces throw them away, run the parser, and then throw away any spaces that come after. So that's where you start to see that these operators do actually make a certain amount of sense once you get used to them. You can see that 
it's kind of visually showing you what's important in that in that line saying we just care about what the, what the the actual parser itself matches and nothing the space around it we're just going to ignore and then i can just splice in that trim function wherever i think i might need it i think i might need it here i think i might need it here and that's just going to take care of stripping out any white space that we don't want to trip us up so does that make sense that comma separated list parser and that's going to deal with arrays and objects very very nicely for us with with no kind of no unnecessary or extraneous code at all really so then the final thing we need to um deal with is this parse key value uh, i'm going to introduce a slightly different syntax here just because i think it's a bit easier to follow um, There's a do syntax, right? You, you can think of a, a parser as being a bit like a promise in a way, and it's kind of monadic in the sense that you can then it, you can sequence operations, right? So, and just like with a promise, you can either use then syntax and kind of create a little Christmas tree, or you can use async await, which is just a sort of syntactic sugar to make it somewhat easier to read. This do syntax is very like that. Do syntax is analogous to async await. Um, and that's why you might hear snarky Haskellers saying that async await is just unnecessarily concretized abstraction that already exists. But think of it in that way. So it's basically doing exactly the same thing. It's just a different syntax. So we can pull values out of a parser, which is essentially and now just waiting for that parser to run and then venning on the end of it. So if we want to get the key from our key value pair, we just need to parse a string. That's all the key is. It's a string. We've already got a parser for that. We recreated it down here. It's exactly the same thing. And then this backward arrow is just the syntax that goes hand in hand with this do statement to allow us to write code as if this were happening kind of step by step, whereas actually it's happening sequentially. So parse string gives us the key. Then we need the separator. And that's just going to be a, a character colon. But again, we want to watch out for white space there. So we're going to trim that. And then we need the value which is just going to be parse value. We already have a parse for that because the value on an object can be any other JSON value. So we just run parse value there. And then we just want to package those two things up in the tuple. And now we have to run, we have to run this pure function. What pure does is basically in, in using this do syntax and using these backward arrows, we're basically pulling things out of the black box, pulling things out of the parser box. At the end of this function, we need to put everything back in the box. And that's what the pure function does. Um, we're not actually using the separator here, so it's kind of conventional. We can just sort of make it clear that we're not interested in that by replacing the name with an underscore. So I think we might be done. So let's see if it works. We can run the Haskell REPL. This is going to load our module into sort of interactive session. We can run main. And although not very beautiful, we can see that it is there. It has created all this, just a refresh our memory what this looks like. We can compare it to that. If we wanted this to look prettier, we would have to write our own 
um, implementation of the show type class to make it look nice. But we can see from here that it contains the right data. And I think we have met all the objectives. There's no ifs, no whiles, no explicit error handling, no loops. And it's 54 lines of code. Um, this parse key value, right? Um, yep. I may use the wrong words, so correct me. Is there any way to write it in the same way as the other parts of the code, like declarative, I guess, is the right word? Or not getting it out of the black box? There is. Um, well, I've got. I've tried to get through this without using the, the M word, the, the monads word. But parser, parser is a, a monad, but also an applicative. And we don't really need the full-blown monad. Here we need an applicative. Um, we can um, we can do parse string. Um, and we can apply trim char, and then we can apply sorry, apply parse value. And then we're going to map all of that over a function that takes um, a key separator, which we don't care about, and a val, and just return key val. Let's just split this up a bit so we can see what we're doing. With any luck, what have I done here? Hmm. Not quite sure why that's not working. Oh. No. Yeah, I missed out a bracket. Okay, so that um that's the the other way we can do it. So this is a bit um I just sort of decided that this might be harder to understand, but this is the same map function that we've used elsewhere. So this whole thing ends up being a parser um, that produces, that, that needs to be fed into a function that takes three things. So this parser gives us a value. Well, we create a function that requires three parameters and we put it inside a parser with no parameters applied. So it's just a, a function awaiting arguments sitting in, a, sitting in a, a parser. And then we incrementally give it each of the parameters that it needs. And that's what this um, apply operator is doing. Uh, <laughs> and if that wasn't clear, that's exactly why I didn't use this syntax. <laughs> but yes, that's the other way you can do it. And it will work just as well. I think actually once you get used to it, that is a nicer way of doing it, but um, this is quite common as well. The, the advantage of doing it this way is that it would mean that your parser doesn't actually have to implement the monad type class, it only has to implement the applicative type class, which is a slightly less demanding thing to implement, but it, like, it doesn't really make that much difference to our purposes. So um, that's it really okay it gets there what we where would you go from here what you what you've got now is a, a valid instance of j value what you probably want to do from that point is parse from j value into some domain type like a student or whatever and um that's a whole other thing although 
it should be clear that what you can do is just compose those two steps together and the end result will just be one thing. Um, so that's nice. And I think the nice thing about this is very easy to read once you have a certain familiarity with Haskell. Uh, it almost reads like a sentence and it's very easy to extend. Like if we if we can see that these two things are sort of analogous, we, we, we could add branches to our sum type to sort of say, you know, have a J date or something if we wanted to deal with like ISO formatted dates. And, you know, we would really only have to add another branch, an equivalent branch into this parse value parser. So I think um, the structure of the parser maps the structure of the type very nicely. Um, and uh, gives us something that's a whole lot more maintainable than what you might try and create any other way. Um, so hopefully that was interesting. Has anyone else got any questions? Right, so I will. I go put the. I'll put the code. Um, I've got the code tucked away. I'll send it out if anyone wants to have a look at it and dig into exactly how it works. Feel free. If anyone has burning issues about uh, questions about Haskell, also, um, let, let, let me know. Let me know. Julian, if you have um, articles you recommend that kind of like uh, have do an intro to functional programming and Haskell in particular, that would be interesting as well. OK, and also if anyone would be interested in a follow up on how you would go on the extra step to do the JSON to domain, then we're happy to do that too, because there's a different set of interesting things about that. Yeah, but so that would work out generically, like you would be able to throw in any type you want to obtain from a JSON and it would be able to do that. Um, the, there's. There are a couple of ways to do it. One is to sort of, you know, let's say you have a, a domain type called student. One is to create a type class called from JSON or something and have a, a, a from JSON function that you would have to implement for that type. And that's probably my, how I would go about doing it. But then the other way you might go is to use like template Haskell to kind of generate the code that does that. And I think that's what the existing JSON parser libraries that everyone uses in the Haskell ecosystem do. So a lot of the time when you're doing for real JSON parsing in Haskell, you just derive these um, uh, deserializers. Uh, and you only really have to get into doing it manually if you have if you have really funny JSON that needs special handling. And Julian, um, those libraries uh, for doing the same thing, do they go much further than, than what you should? Seem like simple in a way, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's it, it, so this what I'm using here is a parsing library. There's a lot of there's a lot more to it. There's a, a lot of more lower level building blocks that come with that. Um, but then there's also a very popular um, JSON parsing library in Haskell, which is like a specialization on top of that. Um, and that that is very, very comprehensive. It allows you to do basically anything you might need. Um, and that's what literally everyone uses. But um, yeah, this, this is more just a kind of for fun thing, I wouldn't. You wouldn't write your own JSON parser if you were writing a Haskell project. Yeah, of course, but yeah, very cool. Okay, Luke. Right. Thanks a lot, Julian. Okay. Okay. Cool. Waiting for the follow up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Waiting for the follow up. Okay. All right. Yeah, let me think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank